but as soon as I saw that article about uh, the Park Service celebrating its centennial, I just latched onto that and it started to feel like something I needed to do. And so uh, the book tells that story of, of starting New Year's Day and finishing New Year's Eve, hitting all the parks and, and finding the threads that connect them. So one advantage to seeing all of the parks and not just some of them is that these links that wouldn't otherwise be obvious due to geography um, start to become uh, much more obvious in terms of theme. So Cuyahoga Valley in Ohio, not too far from Charleston, and Kobuk Valley in Alaska, which is north of the Arctic Circle, maybe the, the farthest national park in Charleston with the exception of American Samoa, those two parks I've lumped together in a, in a chapter about food and how people live off the land and our relationship um, uh, to the land. Uh, and so, yeah, that's that's the book. It tells the story, somewhat of a personal story, but more of a story of these fascinating places and the, the people I meet along the way. Awesome. Very nice. So out of all the national parks that you visited, do you have one or two that you would consider your favorite? And what made those parks special to you? Well, the first ones I ever went to um, coincided with the first time I was ever on a plane. I was 14 years old. We went to Yeager Airport. And we flew out west, flew to Phoenix, although I'm sure via some other airport. Um, and we went on a tour of some of those western parks. So the Grand Canyon, Zion National Park in Utah, Bryce Canyon National Park in Utah. And uh, if, you've, if you've ever been out that way or even just seen a picture of it, it's so different than all of the natural beauty that can be found in West Virginia. And that really opened my eye. One is not better than the other. They're just so different that it, it made me realize how vast the diversity of scenery and the country is. Um, it looks like Mars out there. And so those parks, I think because they were my first and because they were so uh, so dramatic, those have, have stuck with me. And they're also ones I've been back to many times uh, since they reward repeat exploration. Zion in particular, there's several different ways you can, you can do that park. And so each time I've tried to go to the same spots I remember and then add on one new trail or, or one new vista. And what would you say is the most interesting thing you've learned from your journey? I mean, to pin down one would be uh, uh, pretty challenging, but the, I went into it knowing that these places would be beautiful. Um, I think that's the one thing everybody knows about the national parks. I was surprised just how interesting they all were. Um, I am a correspondent for CBS Sunday Morning, and so some of these parks we did for the show, and that was how I convinced my boss to even say yes to that idea, to do about a third of them for the broadcast, is to prove to him that they were home to the same types of stories that we would find on Sunday morning any year, stories of food and family and art and architecture. Um, and so uh, sometimes that meant I had to drill down to a, a very small level. I mean, there's, there's millions of acres in some of these parks and at Death Valley, a park that I think is three million acres, I did a story on the devil's whole pupfish. It is the rarest fish in the world. It only lives in this one tiny little puddle in Death Valley. Um, and so the story of that fish, and it's a longer story, but, but basically it's partially responsible for why we have the Endangered Species Act. It's um, the idea that you don't just protect the cute things. It's not all just bald eagles or, or polar bears um, that, uh, that resonated with me. Um, the story in Cuyahoga Valley that I was referencing, uh, that's a, a restaurateur in uh, downtown Cleveland who always felt disconnected from the food that he was serving. Um, he was all Mr. Farm to Table, um, but that he was buying from other farmers. He was basically buying a story. And so he wanted to live that story. And so at that time, Cuyahoga Valley was allowing people to lease the farmland, much like West Virginia. They had a lot of old family farms but it essentially gone out of business. You know, there, there were uh, larger farms sprung up, those farms fell into disrepair. And so some of those farms were inside of the park. They put out some applications uh, or put out like a leasing program. And so this chef who didn't know anything about farming applied and was granted to come and live with inside of the national park. And so that was a story about, you know, his, his ambition, his, his connection to the land that he sort of discovered later in life and how disconnected so many of us are. I think when you go to the when you go to the Canal City Croakers, you know the the food that's that's well presented in in those aisles. You don't necessarily think about where that came from. And so uh, 
that's that's a story that resonated with me. But I could go on and on. And honestly, part of why the book exists is that we only did a third for the show. And I realized after having gone to the mall that I could have just as easily done those other two thirds for the broadcast. They all had worthy stories. And I was really having to cherry pick which ones ended up on TV. And so in the book, I was able to go back and tell all those stories that I didn't have a chance to tell on the broadcast and to go deeper on some of the ones that did. In TV news, we've only got four minutes, five minutes often tops to tell uh, a story that deserves more time than that. Uh, and so in the book, I was able to, to tell some of that and also tell some of the history that, that we weren't able to accomplish on the broadcast. Right. And do you have any advice for those who wish to take the journey through national parks themselves? Yeah, I mean, the... Well, first of all, a lifetime is a much more achievable goal than a year. A year was a, a verging on insane way to do that journey. Um, at the time, there were 59 national parks, so that's quicker than a park a week that I was trying to uh, hit. Also, I'm sure if a, if a West Virginian is watching this and wondering, well, hey, like, aren't there national parks in West Virginia? There's a, a distinction between what the National Park Service manages and then what actually constitutes a national park. And, and I frequently find myself clarifying that, so I should do it here. Um, places like Harper's Ferry or the New River Gorge, those are all national park sites. Um, there are 400 and some of those. There is a smaller group that is now 62 strong of uh, official national parks that were created by an act of Congress. And often that's, that's really the only distinction. Um, so, you know, Congaree in South Carolina is a national park. Harper's Ferry is, I think, a National Historic Park, or I forget whatever the distinction is there, but like both equally impressive depending on what you're looking for. So I guess what I would start with is like, in a way, don't do what I did. You know, it's, it's easiest to start a journey like this closer to home. Don't feel like you have to fly to Alaska to experience something that's a national park. There is probably, some, I mean, heck, Kanawha State Forest for that matter. Um, it, that's a place I always go to when I, when I come home. Um, but you, I, I do think you'll find if you explore a little farther and you do start hitting some of those ones out of state, you will become addicted to it. Um, so to take it as a cautionary tale that I think at some point, once you hit 10, you, you start getting real curious about what else is out there. So the, the advice would be, don't worry too much about the starting point, whether that's a state park of which there's plenty of beautiful ones in West Virginia, um, if that's a, your closest national park unit or it's, or it's you know, the one You've always wanted to see the Everglades. Go to whatever one strikes your fancy first, and then you can you can find your way from there. And you've had a wide range of experiences throughout your career. Uh, could you share some of your best experiences with us? Um, you know, it's been a treat uh, to come actually back to West Virginia and do a story. We did a piece a couple of years ago on the pepperoni roll, which like my colleagues in New York had never heard of. Um, that... Uh, was was fun to get to share that with the rest of the country. Um, uh, a lot of the travel that I've gotten to do, I mean, now I, it's tough for me to plan a trip and not find a way to trick work into paying for it because I've gotten, I've gotten real good at that, at finding a place that I'm <laughs> curious about and then convincing them that there's a worthy story there. Um, and so uh, uh, whether that's, I mean, we did a piece in the Seychelles, we did a piece in the Galapagos Islands. So I've been very, very lucky um, to take those trips. The one, the trips that, that I always prioritize and pay for myself are the ones back home. And so uh, it's, it's always nice to, to come back to Charleston. I, I'd love to be there right now, although sadly it'll probably be a little bit before I'm hopping on a plane again. Um, but yeah, the, the, what I've learned working for Sunday morning and in writing this book is that great stories can come from anywhere. They can come from the past. I mean, I tell an interesting story about Teddy Roosevelt I'd, I'd never heard before in, in the book. Um, they can come you know, from your own backyard. Uh, and and it's, it's more about how you tell them and the characters that you populate them with. And, and that is something that West Virginia has in spades are good characters. So <laughs> that's, I, I feel lucky to have grown up around so many good characters um, and, and take that with me when I, when I head out on the road. Um. And uh, you are a Charleston, West Virginia native. What do you miss most about the Mountain State? Um, I mean, I think it comes back to to the people. There are there are a lot. I mean, my family obviously and, and friends that, that live there. Um, but 
as I found many times over, there are lots of beautiful places uh, around the country, around the world. West Virginia is one of them. Um, but depending on what you're into, there are other ones. If you like that dusty Southwest scenery, well, then there are places that have that. If you like the ocean, there are probably better beaches than Myrtle Beach, but there are <laughs> there are beaches where you can enjoy that. Um, and so you'll, you'll never be hard up to find a pretty place. So I, I like, as much as the beauty of West Virginia speaks to me, it's the people that I think are, that's a rarer commodity. The, the friendliness, the, the everybody looking out for each other, um, that's what I've come to appreciate more. I think the, the more time I've spent out of state is, is how special that is. Um, uh, my cameraman, uh, just as sort of an aside, uh, who I filmed some of these stories with, he's now been to West Virginia a couple of times. His go-to t-shirt is a Taylor Books t-shirt that he bought while he was here. Um, and uh, he, he grew up in Phoenix. And so funny enough, you know, he, it was interesting to see West Virginia through his eyes because the lush green you know, forests that was not a part of his childhood. And so I think where I was, I really responded to, to his world when I visited there for the first time as a kid, when he came East, when we were doing some of these stories, when we, we cut through the Smoky Mountains, we did that story on the pepperoni rolls. Um, it was interesting to, to see that uh, through his eyes. So um, all of those things I miss. And then like dumb things like Husson's Pizza. I have no idea if Husson's Pizza is any good. I feel like it tastes good to me because I grew up eating it. So there's things like that where it's like, like you, you'd think I would have like, or even like a steak escape. I mean, like I wish it was sometimes more like local spots and I've got those, but sometimes I just want a good old Hudson's pizza. And so that's something, whatever I have for dinner tonight, it's only three o'clock on the West coast, uh, but whatever I end up eating will not be as good as the Hudson's pizza that I would rather be eating. So. Right. And where can we find more information about you and your new book? Uh, well, the book is is on sale anywhere you can you can buy books, or hopefully you know at the library. Although I know your collections are harder to check out right now, but when when the doors open again, hopefully somebody can come in there and pick it up in person. Um, it's available digitally as well. Uh, I think Taylor's is back open again. So as as bookstores are starting to open up. That's the first place I'd look, but it's also on Amazon. It's on barnesandnoble.com. It's booksamillion.com, all those places. Um, and then uh, I, uh, I guess you can find about me on, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. It's just my name, Connor Knight. And um, that's how you can find me on, on all those spots. So. Nice. And at this point, uh, we'll go ahead and ask the audience for their questions. And uh, what you'll need to do is to type those in the chat. You should see the chat controls at the bottom of your screen. Mm -hmm. I've got a question for you, by the way. Do you guys still do write for Fright? That was such like a formative part of my Halloween uh, poetry writing childhood uh, uh, experience. Is that still a thing that the library does? I'm honestly not sure. Um, I'm still fairly new to the library, so I'm still learning some things. So, yeah. they've not seen my trophies along the wall. I'm just kidding. I'm sure <laughs> there's no trophies. <laughs> um, uh, with right now, is there a way that physically anybody can check out a book from you, or is that all uh, still on hold for right now? Oh, right now everything's digital. Um, they can connect to Hoopla, WV Deli, or RB Digital to find our digital offerings. So, um, um, I'm sorry. I see a question here. I think I can see the questions. Or yeah, you asked them to me. I think they're. I can, I'm starting to see them coming in too. But yeah, you, you pick. Take your pick. Okay. Um, let's see. The first one uh, we have from the library. I'm a big Sunday morning fan, so it's great to hear you. We've enjoyed the segments. How is it to be a featured journalist in a pandemic? That's a good question. Honestly, it looks a lot like this. It's a lot of Zoom interviews, um, especially my beat has often been travel. We have some New York-based correspondents. We have some LA-based correspondents. And then, if anything, I, my, my bureau is like the road, the world. And like those are the stories that you can't do right now. Um, I've done a few. Uh, I did a story on uh, what happens to zoos during a pandemic. So like, you know, when you close to the public, someone's still got to feed the hippos, you know, they, they still need food. And so it was a situation where there was no revenue coming in, but yet the expenses had stayed exactly the same. <clears throat> um, and so I went to the San Diego Zoo, which I happened to be in LA at the time. So that was one I could drive to. 
Um, I drove to Joshua Tree and did a segment on what it's like to have the national parks be closed. Most of those are open again, but that was a weird thing, not just to be a journalist during the pandemic, but to, to be a guy who wrote a book about national parks that came out during the week in which all bookstores and most national parks were closed was certainly something I, I could have never envisioned. I think now both of those have, have come back. But uh, I mean, we've got, there's a whole protocol that CBS deals with now in terms of how we conduct our interviews. Um, there's just a classic trope of like news. If you've watched any TV news show on our network or any others, you've seen the walk and talk, a journalist and the subject walking down wherever they are. We don't do those anymore because you, it, you, it's hard to shoot that when you're six feet from the person. So we do like the, the stand and talk or the like wave or whatever. Um, so there's just some nitty gritty kind of production things that have to change. Plus the everything else you'd expect, wearing a mask, um, uh, you know, making sure we have a plan for how everything's sanitized. So it's been a challenge. It's been interesting. I've, I've been really impressed with how the show has responded to it and how our viewers have given us some flexibility on that front. I think they, like Sunday morning's a show that generally looks very beautiful. It's, it's images of the national parks. It's, it's, we have the best photographers in the business. Um, it's, it's a little pixelated looking right now, but that's, I think the audience understands. And so it's, it's been nice to have that flexibility. And we also have a question from Dan. He says, reading your book now, and I love your sense of humor. How can I get it autographed by you? And also go GWHS class of 1999. Well, that's right. That was, that was <laughs> read in reverse order. <laughs> Yay, GW99. Uh, the autograph, actually the last thing I autographed in my life was probably a GW yearbook. Um, it was the last time I signed my name in a book <laughs> was probably that class yearbook. Uh, to actually get this book autographed, I, my hope is that at some point, and it may not be until the fall, I come through Charleston and and do something, whether it's at Taylor's or wherever, um, and, and have a, an in-person event. So if for a Charleston person, that's the easiest way. I've had other folks ask me about that, and it's it's tough. I mean, we like random houses, warehouse is closed down right now. I don't know where I'm gonna be. So I, I promise I'll do it, but I, I honestly don't know the easiest way. Cause if I had you mail it to me, I'm, I'm at an Airbnb right now. I'll be, I'll be gone in you know a week. Um, so I'd say the safest thing to, ask, to, to do with that if you're asking from Charleston is uh, I'll be back and sign in the person. I'll get to you, Dan, don't worry. And we also have a question from Mallory. Referring to the Zion chapter, you focused on the overuse of the park, but what was your favorite part of your experience there? And also thank you for talking with us. The festival and mountain stage team miss you. Oh, shucks. It would not be a Charleston chat if I did not literally know everybody so far. <laughs> so I know who Valerie is too. I knew who Dan was. Um, uh, the, uh, my favorite part of Zion, well, the, the, Overuse is, I mean, the park is popular for a reason. So at least people are, are all going to it because you know, it's great. I mean, it looks beautiful. Um, I found that the earlier you arrive and the farther you walk, um, and this sounds obvious, but like that's, that's a very easy way to avoid those crowds. So the key was just knowing that it's gonna be real popular. So you don't arrive there at 10, 30, 11, try and get there at 7, 38, uh, maybe even earlier, you'll have the park to yourself. Uh, you're more likely to see wildlife. So it's still the same trails, but also like going, I mean, even just more than a mile from the parking lot starts opening up a different side of the park for you. So many people are there to walk, take the picture and leave. Uh, the one thing I would not recommend right now, and it's just my personal risk tolerance, uh, is Angel's Landing. It's a one, one of the most popular trails in the park, probably one of the most popular trails in the entire park system. And it's so crowded that I find it to be unsafe um, just because all it takes is one person slipping and then you knock a whole roll of people down. People have died on that trail. It's one that when we went at 14, I begged my dad to let us do and, and he did not let us do. And looking back on it, he was right. And that was actually even before it was crowded. It wasn't that bad then. Um, so that's one I would, I would probably avoid. Uh, the parks as they've been dealing with COVID related issues I think in a way are getting a preview of how they might deal with visitation challenges in general. So as they all get more and more people, um, there's been talk about permitting entry, timed entry. And so 
there's a bit of a trial of that right now uh, at Yosemite um, where that's a park that can get crowded, but they still let everybody in the doors. Well, not, or in the gates, uh, not currently. Right now they're trying to figure out uh, uh, X amount of people per day. And I have a feeling if that goes well, that may be a preview of, of what's to come of those. But I wouldn't let my, um, that chapter on the crowding discourage anybody from visiting any of those parks. It's just being smarter about how you do it, but they're certainly worth seeing. And we also have a question from Susie. What were some of the greatest needs that you observed during your national park travels? And are there things that we as citizens can do to help protect these cherished sites? So the greatest challenge facing all national park sites, and this is basically me quoting John Jarvis, who was the former director of the Park Service, is climate change. I mean, you see that in every park. It's also, by the way, affecting uh, Marmet. <laughs> I mean, it's affecting it from the smallest town to the greatest national park. It, it, it's impacting everywhere. Um, you notice it more in the parks because they're uh, more, I mean, they're, they're laboratories in a lot of ways. You see indicator species start to decline. And so that's all the stuff that you'd be doing, hopefully anyway, um, in your town, still protect the park that is far away from your town. Um, because all of that uh, makes a difference. Uh, there's a huge maintenance backlog in the parks um, in the billions of dollars range at this point. Um, and so that's nothing that uh, an individual, you're not going to go build that bridge that needs to be rebuilt in the park, but continuing to press your representatives to prioritize them, I think, uh, can move that along. It's, it's a funding issue and they're, they're underfunded. They have always been underfunded, so it's not particularly new, but as more and more people visit them and as some of that infrastructure is older and older, it's, it's coming to this head where it's kind of a, a dangerous uh, situation. Um, and so the parks enjoy overwhelming support. That's what's great about them. It's not a Democrat or Republican thing. It's across administrations, across generations for the most part, People love them, um, and but sometimes they love them in theory. So it's more loving them in practice and letting people know that like this is a thing that matters to you. This is where you would like money to go. Um, I think is a a way that you can do that. And there's the small thing. picking up trash always helps, um, but the the bigger changes um, uh, in terms of uh, you know preservation and, and also exposing them to a younger generation. I think if you've got kids or grandkids, depending on you know how old anybody is who's watching this, like. There's a lot of demands for that kid's attention. I'm very lucky to have had parents who made sure that nature was a priority in my life growing up. I'd like to think that that would have happened if I was a kid today as well, but there's a lot more competing for your attention. I didn't have iPads and you know and video games until I was like you know, 12 or 14 or something. So the, the all of those demands, texting wasn't a thing. It's, it's convincing a kid to look up from their phone and look out at the, at the horizon. Um, and so, once you're there, you love it. Um, and so if you've got a, a kid, a niece, a nephew, whoever, you know, that you can help expose them to that, because that will be the generation who has the voting power to continue to protect these places. So continuing to prioritize that. Okay. And we have another question from the library. What is a hidden gem park that people don't know about? Hmm. Um, yeah, I was surprised how many of them I didn't know about. I kind of assumed it would be like, I don't know, if you look at a list of like the 50 best movies of all time, maybe you haven't seen them all, but you've heard of them. You know, you know The Godfather's a thing. Uh, the park, there are like half of them I'd never heard of before. Um, so, uh, and I found that those are the ones that I really uh, enjoyed. Uh, Dry Tortugas National Park, sounds like a made up place. It is, uh, if you go all the way to Key West in Florida, hop on a boat and go, I think 60 miles further out into the ocean, you come across this, uh, brick fort that's basically in the middle of nowhere. Um, fascinating park, very small park, very difficult to access because you have to take a boat or a seaplane where you land on the ocean, um, but, but a fascinating place. Uh, one that's a little closer to home uh, for Charleston folks would be, uh, uh, I mean, honestly, even I mean, it's a, Mammoth Cave, Kentucky just wasn't really on my radar. It's not that far from Charleston. I don't know if that counts as a hidden gem or not. It, it is literally hidden in that it is underground. Um, but that's a park that just never was on my radar so much growing up. And so uh, that's a great one. Uh, Congaree in South Carolina 
is don't go now. Summer would be a horrible time to go, but like in the in the spring before the mosquitoes get there, that that is a underappreciated uh, in Jim kind of park. Um, Great Sand Dunes in Colorado is one that I also really liked. Uh, I'd never heard of that before. I'd heard of Rocky Mountain National Park, but Great Sand Dunes is exactly what it sounds like. It's sand dunes, but in the middle of the Rocky Mountains. It looks like a place that should not exist, and, and I thought that was really interesting. But they're all great. I mean, there's no bad, I mean, the ones you've heard of are justifiably famous. It's just, unfortunately, that there's a lot you haven't heard of that also deserves some attention. So. And we have a question from Dan. We are planning to be in Sequoia in August. Do you have any special suggestions for enjoying the park other than what is in your book? And P.S. You make us proud. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Uh, the, I mean, Sequoia is nice because it sort of tells you what you're supposed to see in the name of the park. Um, it is the Sequoia, you, and plus you also can't miss it, but like Sequoia, like you, you will be just, you will be wowed by the giant sequoias. It's the largest tree in the world. I think it's the largest living thing in the world by volume. Um, and so that big trees trail that I talk about in the book is is absolutely worth doing. It might be a little crowded at the beginning, but you can easily get away from folks. Uh, but Kings Canyon National Park, which I don't devote as much space to in the book, um, it's adjacent to Sequoia. They're co-managed uh, in a way. So if you, if you visit one, you're literally next to the other. That is more of a wilderness park. So um, there's not a lot of roads that go through it. Uh, most of it is backcountry. So if you're up for a, a little bit of a longer hike, uh, gosh, I forget the name of the hike that I did there recently. It was actually after, so I've revisited a lot of these parks since the year uh, of seeing them all. And my brother and sister and I, uh, who all live in different places, all converged on Kings Canyon uh, last year and uh, went and, and took a trip uh, to uh, a what the heck was it called? Anyway, there's, there's lots of great hikes there. Um, so uh, I would say check out Kings Canyon too. If you're, if you're at Sequoia, you've, you've gotten close enough. You might as well drive that extra 30 minutes, 45 minutes and explore some of Kings Canyon. Plus there's Grant Grove in Kings Canyon, which are some other amazing trees if you're just looking for trees. Okay. And we have another question, uh, totally off topic, but does Charles Osgood always wear bow ties or just on screen? I can't picture him in a regular tie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't want to speak for him, but I, ha I have also never seen him in a regular tie. Although I don't know how far back the bow, certainly ever since I've known him, it's been bow tie. Um, I got to imagine there was a point in his career, he's been on TV forever. There was probably a shift where he went from normal tie to bow tie, but I, I think it's bow tie. I would be surprised if he's wearing a tie much at all these days. Ever since he retired, I think he's chilling. He's got a house in France. I, I, my hope for him, even though it's hard to picture, is that he is not wearing any sort of neck wear at the moment. And I have another question for you. Um, so in all of the parks you visited, you've had lots of experiences and things. Um, in West Virginia, do you have a specific park that you'd say is your favorite or that stands out to you? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, the ones I know the best are the ones that are, are local to Charleston. So Kanawha State Forest is great. Um, the, I forget if it's Wallace Hartman or Harmon, but the that preserve that's up at the uh, uh, edge of... or it's more like a path that cuts between two neighborhoods, but even that is beautiful and, and worth the... Uh, their distance to home, I don't get to enough. Normally when I'm back these days, it's a family focused trip. So I've got a week of, of wanting to see everybody. So I, I actually don't get to see as much West Virginia nature as I'd like, but um, uh, what's nice is you don't have to go too far for it. I mean, it's. There are other places, Los Angeles for that matter, um, where I'd lived for a decade, like there's some stunning spots, but they're all like a couple hours of a drive. You know, you you get on any road in West Virginia for more than 15 minutes, you know, you, even if you start at the Capitol building and within 15 minutes, you're in the woods. And I like that about West Virginia. It's, it's not hard to find some some escape from city life. So. And is there anything that you'd like to add that we haven't covered? Oh, no, that's it. Thank you for having me. Good luck with the transition to the new space and the, well, and then when you transition back to the, to the 
the new new space whenever that gets built that looks amazing i've seen the mock-ups online so I, I hope that all pans out for you it looks like a great spot i'll be rooting for uh for that to get built very nice thank you and thank you so much for attending today we really appreciate uh you taking the time to be with us and uh, thank all of you for being here to participate and we hope we'll see you at another program soon thank you again connor yep you bet thank you